is uh, to give you guys a quick crash course in uh, CNC machining, uh, going over a lot of the basics. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm going to skip over a lot of things, go through pretty quick. Um, you know, the, the hope is to give you kind of a flavor of what's going on, a lot of places to get started. Uh, you know, if you find yourself wanting to run the machines, you know, there'll be a little bit more, you know, homework for you to do as you're setting things up. And of course, Mark and I are here to help you absolutely with any questions that you may have, any, anything that I skimmed over too quickly uh, as, uh, as I give you this introduction. So don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out to us if there's anything that you're interested in, in trying to do here uh, and need any follow-up. But uh, without any further ado, uh, so what is CNC machining? Generally speaking, we're talking about uh, milling, although there are other types of computerized uh, machining tools. So, you know, basically we're using a, a computerized cutting tool to carve the piece that we want out of some solid block of the parent material. Um, so what is it good for? Well, of the ubiquitous, you know, most common ways of making things, uh, it's gonna be by far the most precise. Uh, you know, certainly in our shop, if you need precision, the CNC machine is the way you're going to get it best uh, using anything that we have here. Um, it also is going to open up access to some of the, the best materials, you know, strongest, toughest, highest performance uh, material properties that you might want. So like this is a jet turbine blade, you know, this is inside of a, you know, turbo fan. This is fancy, incanelled, unobtainium, you know, garbage that, you know, is going to be very hard to make uh, through other techniques. Um, it also is, is kind of interesting in that of the sort of, you know, maybe professional, serious uh, manufacturing techniques, uh, it's pretty good at small production runs. So if you're doing prototypes and other kinds of R&D kinds of things, you're going to find CNC machining a lot uh, because you can just make one part uh, pretty flexibly. Uh, but there are also a lot of techniques where uh, you can realistically, where it's needed, mass produce a lot of stuff. So, you know, if you have uh, an Apple laptop uh, for the last decade, right, those, those have been machined out of a solid brick of aluminum, the whole chassis of those things. So, you know, they figured out how to make millions and millions of these things relatively uh, cost effectively. So. Uh, there is kind of this interesting um, flexibility there. What's it bad for? Well, this first one uh, is maybe going to be uh, a little obvious as we go through, through today. So it is not trivial to set up. It requires some skilled labor to understand how to turn your 3D model into an actual part. Um, and so, especially in an R&D perspective, right, if you just need the one thing, there's a lot of cost that's sunk into creating that workflow just to make the one part. Um, I'd like to think it's not, not that hard for you know, a mere mortal like us, not a professional machinist, to figure out how to do it. But it's, it's certainly non-trivial, uh, especially as you get into more complicated things. Uh, number two is that uh, it can really be relatively expensive to make, even if you're making a lot of things. So you got to bear in mind, right, if you're getting something made at a serious factory, every machine there is going to cost a million dollars or something, right? And so to some degree, it just boils down to your cost per item is going to be, you know, the, the cost of that machine, you know, some hourly rate multiplied by the, by the number of hours or minutes or seconds that it takes to make that part. So something like this stupid uh, Triton that I machined as a demo, right? This took two hours to make. So if you got to pay some obscene hourly rate times two hours to make this versus say, you know, the, the plastic housing for this thumb drive, which was made in an injection molding machine that took, you know, two seconds or something, you know, that injection molder cost a million dollars too, but I only had to pay for two, I only had to rent it for two seconds. So the, the relative cost of this part is much, much lower. So if you're making a lot of things, you know, you're gonna wanna go to uh, some of these cheaper, uh, more scalable techniques if you can. Um, number three, you know, because this is a subtractive process, it can be extremely wasteful. 
you can look, you know, the aerospace industry is notorious for this. Like the landing gear of a 747 starts as a thousand pound brick of aluminum. And by the time it's done, it's 15 pounds of actual, you know, strut and 985 pounds of just metal chips that they have to sweep into the trash can. So that, you know, it could be very time consuming. It can be very wasteful uh, in order to get that final, final part. Um, and lastly, you know, these machines can't just make absolutely anything you can think of, right? 3D printers are really the, the, the bee's knees for bizarre geometry, right? The machines I'm gonna be showing you today, uh, what we're gonna be doing is called three axis machining, right? Where the tool is coming from above, we can move it around in X, Y, and Z, but that's all we can do. So if I have a thing where I have to get up underneath it, you know, I wanna make an undercut or something, now life gets really, really difficult. So, you know, we are still very much constrained about what we can make, uh, at least what we can make without uh, a lot of pain in terms of trying to do fancy stuff, right? Do I have to put it in the middle this way to get it this bit and then flip it over this way and try to get some more? Uh, it can be very, very fussy. So um, it doesn't solve every problem. Safety-wise, uh, there's not a lot to worry about vis-a-vis -vis your safety. Uh, they are generally enclosed. Uh, so hopefully if you do anything too boneheaded, it probably won't actually hurt you. Um, you know, there are certainly issues of like the tool can break and then it pings across the room. So, you know, if you're wearing safety glasses, you're probably gonna be fine. The main concern is safety for the machine, right? This is a machine that is made out of metal that is designed to cut metal. Uh, it is very easy for you to break it uh, or make it upset. So we want to be very careful about doing that. Um, and so uh, what are uh, we going to do to, to make it upset? By far the most common thing is you screw up something in how you program the machine, right? This is the classic programming error of it did what you told it to do, not what you meant to tell it to do. So uh, by far, you know, the, the main thing that I'm going to be doing as I'm going through this process is, you know, taking out insurance on my own stupidity, uh, my own bad programming when I'm still waking up, uh, and trying to make sure that if I do something boneheaded, it will not be catastrophic. Um, you know, there are also other issues, like you can see here, I got some little gifts of like, you know, up at, up at the top, that part wasn't clamped down properly, um, things like that. So, you know, generally uh, you wanna try to avoid being dumb. Um, so the main kind of rules are, you know, when you have a new program that you've just created, that's when you want to be especially uh, dubious of your, your, uh, <laughs> whether it's going to work. Um, we're always going to be supervising the job while it's going with a, you know, with a hand on the emergency stop just in case. Um, and this last one I'll show you when we're actually at the machine, but we're going to use uh, the ability that we have to instantaneously throttle the speed of the machine from regular speed to super speed to zero uh, in order to give us some additional time to react. You know, you cannot hit the emergency stop in a millisecond. So let's uh, give ourselves a little bit of time uh, to catch the problems. So tools. Um, there's a wide variety of tools. Uh, square end mills like these are kind of your main workhorse. They're... Uh, you know, like a drill, but square. Uh, and these are gonna be basically what we're gonna use to remove the, the bulk of the material. Um, larger diameter tools will cut more stuff, uh, but they are harder to fit into nooks and crannies. So we're gonna weigh that mainly. Uh, if you're a starving student, uh, smaller tools are also cheaper. So uh, sometimes there's a benefit to just saying, you know, I'll let it take another few minutes so I can pay $5 for this thing instead of $50, um, especially if I'm gonna potentially break it. Um, there's a huge variety of different kinds. Uh, there's coatings and geometries and whatever. Uh, the main thing that you know will help you out 99% of the time is most, mostly we're gonna cut steel or we're gonna cut aluminum. Uh, a steel cutting end mill like this one here, which is what we're, gonna, what we're gonna do today, has four or more cutting edges and aluminum has two or three. So. You, if you can't tell by color, if you can't tell by geometry, you can just tell by how many, you know, you can count to four. Uh, so uh, that's easy enough. Uh, ball end mills are really cool. Uh, so these have a 
sort of a spheroidal end on them. Uh, and this is how we're going to make complex flowing shapes like this uh, little Triton thing here. So the basic notion is, right, if we're doing a stair-steppy thing with a square tool, we're going to end up with a stair-steppy thing. Uh, if we do that same kind of operation with a rounded tool, those rounded sections will kind of blend into each other and leave you with something that feels super, super smooth, thanks to the wonderful world of you know, tangents and stuff. Um, there's obviously drills. Uh, we can drill holes. The main thing to think about here is the normal drill bits that you're familiar with, they are super, super long, and they can tend to sort of flop around a little bit. So all that precision of the machine and locating the drill exactly where you want it, well, the drill bit can sort of bend. And so what we're going to do a lot of the time is we're going to use a shorter than usual drill bit. Shorter is stiffer. It can put the hole where we want it to be. Uh, so either we just drill the hole with that one, or we start the hole with a little one and then finish it with a big one if we really need all that length. But you know, you often don't need it, so you just skip it all together. Uh, we can cut threads uh, if you need screw threads in your part. Uh, and there's a huge world of what are called form tools, where the, the shape of the tool has the actual geometry that you want. So you just <laughs> through with the, the tool. So you, know, you want O-ring grooves or dovetails or whatever. You, know, you, you can even get like weird special order bits with whatever crazy geometry you want, if, if that's something that you need. Um, but you know, that's more than enough about tools. Uh, when you're choosing a tool, the thing that you're going to need uh, almost immediately is a quote unquote recipe for that tool. Uh, there's a lot of different things about how we may want that tool to operate, but the most important things are what are called the speeds and feeds. And that's the speed at which the, the tool is spinning and the feed rate through the material. Um, and so those are kind of the things that we need to tell the computer. Uh, and we calculate those, sorry, I'm a physicist, so I always go back to first principles. Uh, and these are basically based around uh, the surface speed, which is the, the linear speed of the edge of the tool. This is essentially saying, basically this is getting down to friction, right? Uh, the, the material that the cutter is made out of, the material that I'm cutting, they can only handle so much heat, so much friction. So based on those values, uh, the laws of physics can basically give us uh, a, a maximum surface speed beyond which we, you know, there'd be dragons. Um, and then similarly, chip load is basically saying how much material can one slice of the cutter remove uh, safely, right? Uh, and again, you know, if, you're, if we're cutting something that's harder, we can't take as much off per slice. Uh, and if we have a stronger tool, which almost always means it's a larger diameter tool, because a larger diameter is going to have more meat there, it's going to be stiffer. Um, yeah, so it's, it's basically this balancing act of the, the, the stiffness of the part versus the stiffness of the tool. Um, and so these are usually things that you look up in a table or get from the manufacturer um, of the tool. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to look these things up and then derive these from there. So as a vague you know, example, right? this tool here, this is about 5 eighths of an inch, 8 millimeters. Um, and so if I want a surface speed in steel of, I don't know, in America they give them in, in uh, feet per minute. So maybe something in the neighborhood of 400 feet per minute. Uh, so 400 feet per minute, this thing has a one inch diameter circumference, more or less. So one revolution goes one inch, so 12 revolutions goes one foot. 12 times 400 feet per minute gets you around 5,000 RPM. Does that make sense? Rough orders of magnitude to get to this. Um, so I know how fast this thing is going to need to turn. Uh, now I can say, all right, what's my chip load? Well. Oftentimes, these are in, in English units uh, given in thousandths of an inch. So if, if we're going to take, say, one thousandth of an inch per slice of the cutter, uh, I've got four cutters. So that's four cuts per revolution. I'm doing 5,000 revolutions per minute. So 5,000 times four is, you know, and then times one thousandth, that's 
20 inches per minute. Uh, is how I get these numbers that I'm calculating the thing with. Um, so, you know, if all of that goes over, you know, it puts you to sleep, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> what we're going to do is basically, uh, for, for most circumstances, we're probably just going to import these settings using the defaults and probably be okay. But this is, you know, uh, important to, uh, to have in the back of your mind. Um, the one last thing I'll, I'll talk about tools is how we're going to put them, you know, hold them together. So this is the, the holder that goes into the milling machine. I'll, I'll be showing you guys in a minute. Um, and essentially the way we've going to do this, if you ever used a Dremel, it's basically the exact same concept. We have a, a collet, which is the exact size, the exact diameter of the tool, uh, and then a nut, which pushes the collet into the holder. And as it drives it in, we've got this little taper so that taper is going to crush down and squeeze the tool really well. So these are called ER collets. They're on pretty much all of our, all of our milling machines. So all I got to do is just uh, put the collet into the nut, put the tool into the, into the collet, and then I can screw this thing onto here. Um, a bunch of our machines, uh, this whole like collet thing is part of the spindle on our fancy milling machines that I'm going to show you guys today. Uh, these are swappable, which is convenient, right? We need to make sure that the, that the machine knows everything about how it's supposed to do the job. And so one of those things that it needs to know is how long I have this tool sticking out of here. Uh, and so by having this thing be assembled in a holder like this, this is repeatable. I can measure it once, and then every time I put it back in there, it's going to go back to the same place. So it's uh, a nice little convenience factor. Um, the other thing to talk about is uh, work holding. So there's a whole bunch of different ways of holding things down. Uh, I'll just skim over a couple of the basic ones. So you know what we'll be using today is a vise, sort of like this. So right, I've got a fixed jaw and a moving jaw. I'm going to clamp my thing in the vise between those uh, jaws. So in order to make this, I'm just starting with a square-ish block of material, holding in the vise, Bob's your uncle. Um, now, sometimes that works great, and sometimes it does not. So one example, uh, when I'm just showing off on the milling machines, this is my little example part. So this is a little screw together, uh, you know, keepsake box or whatever, I don't know. Um, and so this is kind of a, a you know, a, a typical situation. I'm starting with two little aluminum cylinders that start like this, right? Uh, and this is an awkward shape to clamp, right? Because I'm, if I just put it in the vise, I'd be holding it in two points, and it would be prone to doing this kind of thing, which is not great. Um, and even worse, right, uh, as is often the case with something like this, I can't do everything all at once, right? I need to hold on to something. So some part of this, you know, part is not accessible to the tool unless I want to saw through the vice jaws and knock it out of the room, which is not exactly what I want to be doing. Uh, so in this particular case, what I've done is I, I've made a, a, a specialized jaw for the vice. So this has the contours of this thing machined into it. So when I'm starting the thing, I have a little round part so I can just stick my material right in there, and now I've got a nice custom holder just for this piece of bar stock. And when I finished making the top half of it, I can take that, say, hexagon and flip it over, and it will fit nicely into my hexagonal-shaped cutout for this thing. Um, so this is how you'll end up seeing, you know, especially when it comes to making like a lot of complicated stuff. Um, you know, investing some effort into making something like this makes it really easy to just say, all right, Pop it in, do a part, flip it over, pop it in over here, do the other part, bam, you're done. Uh, and so uh, this way you can be really efficient. So like when I'm giving a tour and I don't want to sit there and faff about for 20 minutes getting things reset up again, uh, it's, it's nice and easy. Um, so you know, there are many other ways of doing, you know, holding stuff down. Uh, like most 
you know, uh, uh, disciplines. There's a million little sneaky tips and tricks, but uh, we'll uh, skip that for now. So uh, let me show you a little bit about the actual software workflow. So right now I've, I've got my part modeled in Fusion 360. Um, Fusion is nice because it has the, the cam stuff built into it. So that's the essentially like the slicer, but for CNC machining. So we're, we're going to take our part as it's designed. Uh, and all I got to do is say, let's go from design to manufacture. And now we are in the manufacturing world. Um, I'm going to keep this in inches, but you can do it however you like. So the first thing I need to do is tell it a little bit about the setup of this part. So I'm going to say I've got a, a new setup. And you know we're doing milling. Uh, first thing I want to do is tell it where 0, zero is. So uh, I'm going to choose this back corner. Uh, to some degree, it's whatever you want to do, right? This is kind of, this is the point in space where we are syncing up the computer world with the real world. So some, usually this is just something, some feature of your part uh, or your stock that's easy to find. Uh, so usually the corner is what you'll want to do, but sometimes you've got like a screw hole or whatever. Um, nothing super complicated. Uh, and then the other thing that I need to tell it is the actual uh, material itself. So uh, I am, uh, I screwed up because I left the part in the, in the vise. Um, so it is pretty important that we try to make sure that we tell it the truth about how big our starting block is. It's going to want to go faster through air than through metal. And if I lie to it and it thinks there's air where there's metal, bad things will happen. So, you know, there, there are a bunch of different modes here. I can basically tell it, you know, there's a, a fixed size box. So in, in our particular circumstance, this is like 60 uh, millimeters in width. It's uh, depth, oh, sorry. It's depth is 60 millimeters. The width is something like 45. Uh, or, I think it's 1.5 inches. Um, and so there we are. Um, so you can see we've got our part, you know, like, like Michelangelo inside the, the, the marble here, uh, our little rectangular starting point. Um, so now we have to tell it, all right, how to go ahead about making this thing. Uh, and so Essentially what we have is a suite of different kinds of operations that we can ask the machine to make. So uh, you can see here there are uh, 2D operations and 3D operations. Uh, basically, 3D operations are based around the 3D geometry. They're looking at the actual model itself. 2D is just looking at basically two you know, uh, flat planes and things uh, about our part. So the first thing I'm going to want to do uh, as is uh, pretty typical, is I'm going to face off the surface. So this is uh, using a really big tool uh, to clean up that top surface. The, the material that you get from the store, from the manufacturer, tends to be really inaccurate. So if we want this top surface to actually be flat and not, you know, like the surface of the moon, we're going to have to clean that up ourselves and not trust that it just happens to be beautiful. Um, so I'm going to say, all right, I've chosen my face. Uh, we've got a series of different tabs. I strongly recommend that as you're going through this, it never hurts to uh, mouse over uh, a particular uh, box. If you're unfamiliar with what this might be asking you, it, this software is full of really great little pop-ups that explain what the hell do we mean when we say spindle speed. Uh, and so this can be a really great way of understanding what you're asking it to do. Uh, I strongly encourage you when you're working with stuff like this, you want to get out of the bad habits that we've all developed from a bunch of really bad programming that we've been exposed to, right? You're, you're, you're constantly being thrown up these pop-ups and you've been trained since birth to say, go away. Uh, I don't care what you have to say, just go away, get out of my way. Uh, you got to kind of slow down a little bit and actually pay attention to what these things are asking you because you can get 
yourself into a lot of trouble uh, if you don't pay attention to, to what these things are telling you. But uh, here, you know, obviously, first off, when I'm doing a new operation, I have to tell it what tool I'm going to use. So I'm going to select a tool from our library. So we've got a, a wide variety of default built-in tools that uh, we, we can pull from. Um, or uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. where is my? Oh. It won't let me bring in a tool from a different thing that I've already made. Well, that's annoying. Uh, so for the one that I've got, we've got you know, if 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 you desperately need to, you can make it up yourself. Uh, so I'm going to do this with uh, a. Actually, screw it. I don't care. Um, normally, we do this with a big mill, but I won't waste the time creating a new tool from scratch. It takes a few minutes, but whatever. Um, so instead, I'll just use the tool I was going to use anyways, um, this guy. And it'll just have to go back and forth a few more times. Whatever. Um, so I'm going to just say, all right, let's go to our milling tools. Um, I want a flat end mill. This is eight millimeters. And I'm just going to tell it what material I'm working with. So this is uh, low carbon steel. And this is roughing. So I'll just say select. And this is going to bring in all those speeds and feeds numbers that I was talking about earlier. So you can see here it's you know according to it, it thinks that for this thing, 6,000 RPM is the right speed. I guesstimated 5,000. It's OK. Uh, we don't really need to worry about dialing this in perfectly, especially for you know, a one-off prototype. Again, we, we have those knobs on the machine. So our main goal here is to get within like 10 or 20 percent, and then we can manually diddle it from there. Uh, what we want to avoid is being you know, 200 percent too fast, and then things will just explode before we have a chance to say, oh, shit. Uh, so that's, that's mainly what we're aiming for here, is just trying to be uh, vaguely reasonable. Um, so with the, the tool selected, now we can give it stuff about the geometry. Uh, it's defaulted to, hey, let's just do the whole top surface of this thing, which is what we want to do, right? You know, we're just cleaning up the whole top surface. Uh, we can give it information about the heights, you know, where, where does it think is safe to move around, where does it start cutting, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it's... Uh, very frequently, the defaults are, are correct. In this case, they are correct. So, you know, it's this uh, teal line is sort of where the material is starting, uh, and then the, the blue line is where the top of the part uh, is supposed to be. Um, and we could also give it information about, you know, which, you know, how, how should it be doing these passes, uh, which direction, you know, how, how much should it step over between passes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Again, all of these things you can just mouse over, and it will tell you a lot more about what it's doing. Um, but we can just go ahead and say, OK, this is probably fine. Let's, let's say OK. And at least now, now it will calculate what it's supposed to do, uh, and it will show us what that's going to look like. So you can see here it's just zigzagging back and forth across the part. Um, and you know, Bob's your uncle. We've got uh, a flat surface here. Um, so that's one toolpath, right? The next thing we'll want to do is uh, go ahead and I'm going to want to cut out this little notch here. So I'm going to say, all right, let's, let's go ahead and do a, I don't know, 2D adaptive clear. Um, and so I'm going to say, all right, we'll use the same tool that we had before, this guy. Um, I'll tell it to do low carbon steel again. And now, we, now we have to tell it, all right, a little bit more about what we're doing. I want to clear out this area here. So that should work pretty well. Uh, and we can also look into, all right, so now our, uh, our 2D operations. Yeah, so our bottom height is, is that contour I selected. That's the thing I'm mainly looking for. Um, and then we can also look at some of this stuff here. Um, 
This is going to be, I'll just click OK so we can see what it's going to do. So here it's basically trying to do some fancy shenanigans in order to kind of maximize how quickly it can remove as much material as it, as it can without, you know, potentially trying to take off too much material and then being, you know, likely to break the tool or otherwise cause headaches. Um, and so uh, this is technically an operation that uh, leaves kind of a, a, an uglier surface. So if you wanted it to be perfect, I'd have to come up back and, you know, clean things up with a finishing pass. Uh, the more material we're removing, the more rough the surface is going to be, usually. Uh, but this is not a part that I really care that much about, so I'm going to say, eh, screw it, we'll just leave it as is. Uh, and I can say, okay. And so here's our second operation. So we're blitzing away all that material. Uh, and then last but not least, I'm going to want to do some holes. So I'll just drill some holes. We're going to select a, uh, a hole making tool. I think. Come on. That looks about right. So we want six millimeters right here. Uh, that's weird. Uh, steel, bam. And so all I got to do is tell it, all right, let's do that hole and this hole. And we're good. So I can just say, okay, and we should be good to go. Does that look weird? Uh, <laughs> uh, so we are basically done, right? I've, I've gone through and I've made the operations that I need to make for this thing. So I'm going to uh, take my thumb drive and I'm going to export this. These machines use G code just like the 3D printers. Please don't take the the 3D printer G-code and try to run it on the billing machine, you will be unhappy. Uh, but uh, all I got to do now is just export that G-code, right? We've, we've essentially rendered it here, and now we just have to save it to a file and, and carry it over to the machine. So I'm going to say post-process, um, which is basically what we call exporting uh, that G-code. A um, lot of parameters. None of this stuff is really stuff that we need to change from the defaults. We just want to make sure that we've chosen the correct machine. So we've got uh, PathPilot for the, the Tormach, the, the CNC milling machines that we've got. And then there's a, a different one for the big CNC router. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure I choose that. Uh, I'll name it something like uh, something helpful that isn't just 1001. Uh, and I can save it to the thumb drive. And presto. So we now have our file on our thumb drive. We can eject this and head to the shop. So let's go into the, into the metal shop and we can fire this thing up, see how quickly I can take my, my tool and uh, install it. It has this system where it just grabs onto this stud on the end and pulls it into the spindle. So I just press this button. <laughs> get my thing in there and let go. And now I've got my tool installed. Uh, and so I can say, all right, uh, let's go ahead and do the, you know, I've told it that this is the tool that I'm using. And now we're going to say, all right, measure. So it's moved itself over that little button. And now it's bringing itself down until it's going to poke that button. And now it's going to know how long that tool is. Um, that's definitely uh, going to be important to do. Um, so we're good there. Now, the other thing I got to do is I need to tell it where the part is, right? So you can see here, I've got my little piece of steel in the vise. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to use a different touch probe, uh, this little guy, that is going to go into the machine. And so now what I can do is I can use my little jog wheel to move this, this thing around. And so I can use, I can get the thing close and then use some more of its little uh, canned routines to measure the surface. So I can say, all right, let's go ahead and probe 
the top surface. So we'll say, all right, let's come down in Z. Oops, forgot to tell it I put the touch probe in there. Uh, let's come down in Z until it pokes the, the top surface. And all right, now it knows where the, the top height of that is. Remember, I told it 0, 0, 0 was the top surface in the back left corner. So I want to find top surface, left surface, back surface, and then I will know where my part is. So I'll just go to X now. We can go down in Z and say, all right, let's now go right until we, we hit something. So there's my left side. And then we'll go forwards. and go y minus until we poke something. And there we are, right? So now we know all the information that we need to know, right? We know where the, where the part is. We know where the tools are. Uh, and so we can be reasonably certain that we're not going to do anything too boneheaded. Um, and so all I got to do now is get set up to run the job. So. Uh, we can go back over here. I'm going to uh, come on. There we go. I'm going to copy my file to the machine, and then I can load it up. Um, Uh, oops. I think I screwed up. I forgot to tell it. I actually set the front as the uh, Y zero, not the uh, back. So. It's hard to talk and think at the same time, uh, especially this early in the morning. Uh, so. There we go. Uh, weird. So I. I accidentally only exported one of the tool operations, but I somehow I only selected one of the three, right? I made the three tool paths, the facing, the, the, the making the step, and then the drill. Somehow I must have only selected one of them. Whatever. I'll, I'll show you this whole operation anyways. You don't, you don't care about whether this part is complete or not. Uh, so I'm just going to throw my tool in there, and we'll be ready to rock and roll. So I've got my file loaded up. I've got my tool in place, right? Uh, I'm going to close the doors, and we're more or less ready to get started. Now, remember what I was saying before about taking insurance against your own stupidity. Uh, I have demonstrated more than enough stupidity already today, so let's try to you know, put a damper on it. These three knobs are our best friend. This is where we can sort of tell it to tweak how it's, you know, the speed at which it's doing the job. So we have the feed rate, the speed at which it's cutting the part, we have the, the spindle RPM here, and then the max velocity. So basically, this is sort of saying, how fast does it move when it's moving at top speed, trying to reposition itself to the next place it has to cut, right? Uh, and so the general rule is we're going to start max speed at zero. Uh, so it does not move. And then we can kind of creep this up. You know, one of the classic blunders that you make is the same blunder I already made today, which is I screwed up keeping track of where the, the correlation between the virtual world and the real world is. So if I tell it that my part is 10,000 feet below the center of the Earth, it will try to get there, inevitably fail, and clobber you know, everything as it's trying to do so. So 
you know, and, and it will be doing that. You know, it says, man, I got 10,000 miles to go. I got to go there fast. So if I have this at 100%, it will go way faster than we can react to it. So I'm going to keep my hand on zero, creep it up to the greatest degree I feel safe. And if I ever feel like, oh, maybe I'm, I'm not feeling comfortable, I can always just go back to zero. It will stop moving. You know, no harm, no foul. Uh, so all I got to do now is say cycle start. Um, it's going to say, uh, let's go ahead and zero itself out. Uh, it is reminding me to put the, the correct tool into the spindle. So I will say, yes, I did that. And now we're ready to get going. So it's spraying this coolant out across the, uh, the, uh, the tool to keep it from uh, getting messed up. And so here we are. I screwed up another thing. Somehow I got it rotated 90 degrees from where I actually wanted it to be. But we're cutting just fine, so that's what's important. So there it is, done with the job. We can go and open the door. I can take my trusty blowgun. Looks like a Batman villain weapon. Uh, blow off all the, the coolant, and we're, uh, we're good to go. So I can unclamp my part and huck it right in the trash, because I screwed it up. Uh, but that's, that's CNC machining. And I'm not even late. It's perfectly on time. Uh, so that's my quick crash course. If you go a little less fast uh, hurried than I do, uh, you, I, I swear I know how to use this machine. Uh, <laughs> I've just been demonstrating all the mistakes that you could be making. Um, if I can get good parts out of this thing, you can too. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.